Okay, well, let's get underway. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Professor Simon Jackman, the Chief Executive Officer of the United States Study Center here at the University of Sydney, which stands, of course, on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, part of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, today, the 14th of December here in Australia, getting late in the year um, by Australian standards, heading into our summer. Um, but of course, the year um, is sort of only halfway through uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. It remains an extremely uh, busy time of year in politics and strategic affairs, as it probably always is, actually. But but um, our guest today uh, is in North America. It is, of course, uh, Martin Indyk, who is um, uh, one of um, Australia's more interesting exports, shall we say, uh, to the United States. Uh, born in the United Kingdom, but raised here in Sydney, indeed, just over on the North Shore, uh, Martin attended uh, the University of Sydney uh, as an undergraduate. Um, and then later uh, the Australian National University for doctoral study, uh, but then um, has been based in the United States for the lion's share um, of his uh, adult life, where he has risen to heights uh, seldom seen by Americans, uh, let alone by um, Australian Americans. Um, Martin um, is currently a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations but critically, and, and this is sort of extremely rare um, for a foreigner, uh, a non-native born American citizen to do this, to serve not just once, but twice as an ambassador uh, to Israel, uh, United States ambassador to Israel. Um, um, he has also served in government as assistant secretary of state for Near East Affairs and was a special assistant to President Clinton. Suffice to say, Martin, um, those are some of the highlights of, I think, what can just be safely said to be a long and extremely distinguished career in diplomacy and, and uh, strategic affairs uh, more broadly in and out of government, uh, in, in think tanks and whatnot. Um, on the think tank side, Martin has been executive vice president of the Brookings Institute, where he's also served as vice president and director of the foreign policy program and was the founding director of Brookings a center for Middle East policy. And of course, not just in the Clinton administration, Martin uh, returned to government service, um, being President Obama's special envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations uh, between July 2013 and June 2014. Um, and so it's a real treat uh, to welcome uh, Martin uh, back, if virtually, to his alma mater, the University of Sydney. Martin, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Simon. It's a real honor to be with you, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. What brings Martin to us today uh, are two factors. Uh, factor number one um, is the fact that um, Martin has recently um, published, uh, just last month, I believe, was the, uh, no, two months ago, October 21, I think, is the official publication date of his latest book, Master of the Game. There it is on screen, Henry Kissinger and the art of Middle East diplomacy. And walking through that book will be our, our focus today. And that brings me to factor number two, um, the wonderful um, Bruce Wolpe, um, tireless uh, non-resident fellow for the United States Study Center, uh, all year long, all through this period now, um, over about 18 months now that we've been um, doing virtual events um, Bruce has been reaching deep into his extensive networks, both in the United States and Australia, um, and helping us secure some time uh, virtually um, with, with, with some amazingly distinguished people. Uh, Martin, uh, no exception to that, that long list, and, and a great way uh, for us to, to end what has been a spectacular year of events and talks and research here at the United States Study Center. So thanks, Bruce. And joining Bruce and Martin today um, is Victoria Cooper, um, who, uh, like Martin, is a graduate of the University of Sydney. Um, but Victoria, uh, critically, is a research associate here at the United States Study Center. Um, one of the great joys of, 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 of working here at the center is the way we're able to give a home 
uh, to uh, uh, students that have completed their studies as undergraduates, but are looking to, to work a little closer to the policy coalface in, in the think tank side of the United States Study Center. And Victoria um, is, is doing just that and adding great value and distinction uh, to the work of the center. And we just thought it'd be a real treat for, for you, but for Victoria, for Martin, for all of us, uh, that to bring um, um, the next generation of foreign policy experts and, 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 and analysts into the conversation today, um, um, sort of at, at um, uh, bridging uh, a couple of generations of University of Sydney graduates here today. So it's a, an especially um, pleasing part of today's event. Um, uh, Bruce, um, the floor is yours to uh, lead our conversation with Martin today. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Very, very kind indeed. Uh, Victoria, thank you for joining this. And Martin, this is just a special honor and, and privilege to have you uh, back home at the University of Sydney, but to join us in this discussion. And uh, I'd like to just start, there is breaking news of the Israel, uh, Israeli Prime Minister visiting uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, meeting with uh, the Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. And what would Henry Kissinger think of this moment of uh, the Israeli Prime Minister going to the UAE on El Al Airlines. And um, how does it reflect his vision of what is possible and when it might be possible in the Middle East? And then we'll turn, uh, then I want to turn to the origins of the book. Thank you, Bruce. It's um, very good to be with you. I'm uh, coming in from uh, Aspen uh, in Colorado, where uh, I'm here to give a, a, a book talk uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, the uh, visit of Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to the UAE, which is historic, the first Israeli Prime Minister to do so, uh, is a recognition of the normalization that has taken place between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. Um, that's moved very rapidly in the, um, what, almost two years, I think, since it, it was first announced. Um, but it's, of course, been a very long time since uh, Israel was established that it has gained the recognition of another Arab country as a recognition of, of Egypt, Jordan, and the PLO. But that's essentially it in the Arab world. Kissinger's belief was that Israel, there was a normal right of states to enjoy the recognition uh, of its neighbors. Um, and so, uh, he uh, would certainly welcome this in his understanding of relations between states as the kind of classic Westphalian man. But Kissinger believed that the Arab-Israeli conflict would only be resolved over a long period of time, time for the Arabs to get used to the existence of Israel and time for Israel to strengthen itself enough to be able to make the ultimate concessions necessary to achieve peace with its Arab neighbors. Um, and so therefore, the normalization between the United Arab Emirates and of course Bahrain and Morocco uh, as well uh, with Israel came somewhat on his timetable. Uh, he believed eventually it would happen. It's been, what, since 1973, um, almost, uh, 50 years. And so that's the kind of timetable that he expected uh, for the Arabs to finally uh, exhaust themselves and come to terms with Israel. And I thought it was particularly telling in that regard that Mohammed bin Zayed, the crown prince of the UAE, when he announced that uh, his country was going to normalize relations with Israel, make peace with it, he said, it's because we're tired of the conflict which uh, was exactly what Henry Kissinger predicted would happen. And, and if anyone can wear you down, it's Henry Kissinger, right? <laughs> and so, we, <laughs> but you mentioned, you mentioned 73. So let's go back to 73 and on both a personal and the origin and then the origins of this book on both a personal and professional level. On a personal level, you were in Israel when the Yom Kippur War broke out. And it obviously had a profound effect on your, it, that it occurred, your outlook, and then ultimately things that you, fell in love with and want to pursue professionally. And, um, and then in a, in, a, in a professional level, it led to a you know, career in, in diplomacy, practicing diplomacy throughout the Middle East and uh, working for several United States presidents. 
So I wonder if you could reflect on that a little bit as a personal driver. But then um, uh, just looking at the book itself, the forensic material, your forensic examination material is just stunning. It's riveting, as I wrote you in my first email on this. And um, can you touch on the access that you had to the documents that made such an examination possible and your discussions with Henry Kissinger and how he's doing and perhaps some of the most more reflective thoughts he shared with you as you went through this history? Well, I had just graduated from Sydney University and uh, had uh, traveled to Jerusalem to do a master's degree in international relations at the Hebrew University when the 1973 Yom Kippur War broke out. I was a very um, impressionable young man who had been watching very carefully the exchanges that had taken place before the war between Egypt's leader Anwar Sadat and Israel's leader Golda Meir and the way in which Sadat seemed to repeatedly uh, offer peace initiatives and repeatedly he was rebuffed by the Israelis who didn't take him seriously. Nor I discovered that Kissinger regarded him seriously at the time either. He, he, his word for him was a buffoon. Uh, and as a consequence, when I was there and the war broke out, it was a surprise certainly to me, a surprise to Israel, and a surprise to, to Kissinger, even though Sadat had been warning repeatedly that if he didn't get his grievances addressed through negotiations, he was going to go to war. Uh, and so I had this strong sense that this was an unnecessary war. And uh, it had a, you know, a, a life-forming experience, uh, an impact, I should say, on, on um, what I decided to do. I was a student of international relations, but as I watched Henry Kissinger uh, shuttle back and forth to negotiate first the ceasefire and then the disengagement of agreement between Israel and Egypt, I became quite fixated on the idea that the United States held the keys to making peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And so I resolved there and then that that's what I was going to work on. And that would be my uh, pursuit in life to somehow um, both learn about the American role in the Arab-Israeli conflict but also to somehow help Israel make peace uh, as a result of, of focusing on the United States. So I went back to the Australian National University, did my PhD on that subject, eventually migrated to the United States. But the reason that I came back to write the book was because after uh, uh, all of that experience in trying to help Israel make peace, and that Simon, uh, articulated when he went through my resume. The last time that I tried was as special envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations under Secretary of State Kerry and, and President Obama. And when that negotiation ended in failure, I came to the conclusion that the parties were further apart at the end of that negotiation than they were at the beginning. Mm. And while that had a lot to do with the toxic relationship between the leaders and people on both sides of the conflict. Uh, it also had something to do with uh, American diplomacy. And I really felt that we had somehow lost the art of Middle East peacemaking. And so I resolved to go back to where it all began uh, and try to understand uh, how Henry Kissinger made peace and, and to see whether from a study of, of his diplomacy, whether it would be possible to learn how to and how not to make peace more effectively than we had been able to do. By the way, not just under the Obama administration, but all the way from Clinton through, through Bush and Obama and Trump. Four And four of them failed. And I think that that is, that is uh, uh, just underscores um, how much seems to have gone wrong in the practice of diplomacy. So I want to understand 
how Kissinger did it, because he was very successful, not only negotiating the ceasefire in the Yom Kippur War, but two Israeli-Egyptian agreements and one between Israel and Syria that laid the foundations for the American-led peace process um, that essentially functioned right through to the time that I oversaw the last of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, when you read the book, uh, you just populate it with some of the most dramatic and searing you know, personalities and events that in my lifetime and your lifetime as well. And all the, all the, they are all there. There's Golda, there's Diane, there's Rabin, there's Perez, there's Sadat, who is just absolutely amazing in how, he is, how you present him, and King Hussein, and Hafez al-Assad, who was the biggest surprise to me uh, in, in how you uh, get to his identity and what he did. And his son is no Hafez al-Assad, I can tell you that. Uh, so th they were giants. And do we have giants in these countries today? Is there, any, is there anyone in the Arab or Palestinian world today who, would consider the equal, who you would consider the equal of Sadat in terms of vision and courage? Well, to some extent, you could say Mohammed bin Zayed um, has the courage and the vision. Of course, his country has never been at war with Israel, and so it's a little bit different. Um, but I have thought a lot as in writing this book about the differences between the people, as you say, who were giants at the time and, and many who seem like dwarfs today in comparison. And I think that, that it has something to do, of course, with their leadership abilities. It has something to do with the way in which Kissinger made them great. But I think it has more to do with the fact that they were leaders who were able to commit their people, who were able to lead their people now, of course, Sadat and, and Assad, the autocrats. Um, but uh, they, they had a legitimacy amongst their people that their successors either didn't have or, or lost as a result of their policies. And Sadat, for example, was very attuned to the needs of his people. And that's what drove him to make war in order to make peace. He wanted to transform the conditions of his countrymen. And he was therefore a real visionary. Golda Meir, had none of the vision of Anwar Sadat, but she did have the ability to take risks for peace and, and when she did so, to commit her people uh, to that course. And she had the political skills to rule over a, a, you know, inevitably unruly coalition cabinet because all Israel's, all Israel's governments are coalition governments given the nature of the political system. And so I think that, that um, they were uh, better politicians, perhaps they were living in different times uh, where social media didn't have the same impact it has today uh, and the divis divisiveness that exists today in so many democratic countries um, really didn't exist in those days. Yeah, so I think the times were different, but nevertheless, um, these were an unusual group of, of leaders who had the courage to lift their eyes to the horizon and seek to make peace with their neighbours. I want to get into the contrast between those times and these times in two respects. First, it, with Kissinger, you had a Secretary of State who spent weeks on airplanes in the Middle East dealing with this, these issues. Can, in today's world, can a Secretary of State with all the responsibilities that the United States has in leadership in the world and projecting its interests and so forth, can, it, can a Secretary of State devote so much time to these, uh, to, to such an engagement? Is that possible? No, I don't think so. And you just have to um, uh, look at the uh, itinerary of, of Secretary of State Blinken or subscribe to this State Department um, uh, communications uh, to see the unbelievable uh, roster of, of issues that he has to deal with and the travel schedule that he undertakes. Um, but, it, you know, I think that, that those were days which were also um, pretty tough for, for the Secretary of State. 
I think it was there rather a manifestation of his determination to try to uh, stabilize the order in the Middle East that he devoted so much time to it. As you say, for the Israel-Syria negotiations, he was out of Washington for 30 days, right. uh, nonstop, shuttling 13 times between Jerusalem and Damascus to get finally get the agreement. But there was another reason for that, which is that he wanted to stay out of Washington because <laughs> Washington was consuming itself with uh, Watergate and the uh, impeachment of President Nixon. And uh, Kissinger wanted to keep his distance from that. And, and he was right, because as soon as he went back, he got dragged into it. And he got summoned before Congress and had to explain himself for some wiretapping that he had approved in earlier times. Um, so I think that, that there was a combination that worked there. And, and on the media side, it's, it's just so interesting to think about. And, and, and Kissinger projecting American power in a time of a weakened president uh, and who, who everyone understood was under assault. But uh, it's the media, too, and the media coverage that I, I was also so interested in the book. The whole press corps of, uh, of the United States was on that plane. And that doesn't happen today. And so, you know, you had the three networks, The Washington Post, L.A. Times, uh, New York Times, Wire Services. And so uh, Kissinger could kind of control the narrative as far as what the press was reporting because he had them all in his hand. And a senior, a senior official would speak to the press every day, right? <laughs> and, and you can't do that today. And we're so bifurcated and diversified and it's um, anarchic. So I guess my question is how much more difficult does today's media landscape make it for diplomacy to be successful in this world? Yeah, it's much more, much more difficult. It's not that the press doesn't travel with the Secretary of State today, they do. But in those days, Kissinger was able to dominate the story. Uh, as you said, he, they, he brought the press with him. Nixon, normally jealous of the way that Kissinger got so much attention and become such a celebrity, uh, was happy to have them go because he, he Kissinger's success was something he could point to, um, to try to argue to his Watergate critics that he, you know, he needed to be kept on as president. So he went along with that, but Kissinger was able to control the narrative, partly because of his celebrity status, but partly because he was you know, achieving breakthroughs and, and um, appearing on the cover of Newsweek magazine as Super K in a, a Superman uniform with a K on his chest. Um, that was the nature of, of the way in which the press treated him. Uh, today, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's not, not just that there are so many more issues that get media attention and compete for attention. It's just that there are so many more uh, sources of information, uh, much of it uh, unreliable information, but it's you're out there competing with uh, uh, so many different uh, means of broadcasting information that it's very hard to dominate the news cycle in which the uh, in the way in which Kissinger was repeatedly able to do uh, through through his you know diplomatic daring go on the uh, Middle East uh, high roads. One. Um aspect of reading your book is just the uh, these juxtapositions of what is occurring in the same rooms or the same physical locations decades later. Uh, and, and sometimes you put yourself in those, you know, when you're doing the negotiations that you're doing and you take us back to the prime minister's office when Golda was there and, uh, and Rabin and the hard decisions they have to make. And you take us to the palaces in, uh, in, C in Syria and everywhere. And I guess, uh, it, it, so there's no limit of time travel in your book, which is, I found just so interesting. And uh, uh, so how did history, and, and then you're in the role, okay, you're trying to affect a peace between Israel and the Palestinians. How much did this history of which you were so cognizant of, that you lived through directly as a young man, and now you're practicing it on behalf of the United States, 
how, and you know what happened and what didn't happen, and you had ideas about why it didn't happen and where failure was, how much did this history weigh on you as you were doing your job? Not enough. <laughs> and uh, Tell us more, please. <laughs> That was the most um, interesting thing about this intellectual journey that I went on in going back to the origins of the American-led peace process. Because I came into the process as Bill Clinton's Middle East advisor in 1993, at a time when all the stars seemed to be aligned for a breakthrough to an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict to a full comprehensive peace. Thanks to the efforts of Secretary of State Baker, uh, before Clinton came into office, all of the Arab neighbors of Israel and the Palestinians were sitting in direct negotiations with Israel. The Soviet Union had collapsed, the Cold War had ended, the Arab states no longer had a Soviet backer for military action against Israel. And uh, it looked like it would be possible and this is what I told President Clinton in our first meeting, that if he put his mind to it, he could end the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, and that's what we went about doing. Now, I say not enough because the people who came after Kissinger, including me, knew not what Kissinger was actually about. And, and this was the most interesting lesson that I derived from my delving into a deep history of, of what took place. Because I had, as you said earlier on, access to all of the documents. And Kissinger, as a man of history, a student of history, uh, recorded everything, every conversation, every phone conversation with Nixon or with Al Haig or with Arab and Israel. And 95% uh, of it has been um, uh, declassified. Right. And so uh, in looking at those detailed exchanges between Kissinger and the Israelis and the Arabs, I came to understand that Kissinger wasn't really seeking peace, seeking the end of conflict that I told Clinton he could achieve. He was actually very suspicious of that idea, he warned in his writings against the pursuit of peace with too much passion. He was always concerned that American leaders with uh, their control of such immense power uh, would try to make the world over in America's image, whether it's a democratic uh, world or, or a peaceful world. And he saw peace, pursuit of peace in that way, as a problem, not a solution. And it was only when I would see him engaging with Sadat or Rabin or even Assad, the Syrian leader, and they would talk about taking the big step about how their people wanted peace. And he would slow them down and tell them, you know, that's not really worth the paper it's written on. You know, we just need to, to have stable arrangements. Uh, he uh, thought that it was far more important to pursue order and stability than to pursue peace. And indeed, he believed that the pursuit of peace with too much eagerness and passion could well achieve its opposite. That is to say, to destabilize the order and produce war. And of course, the primary examples of that was Woodrow Wilson's efforts at Versailles at the end of the First World War, an appeasement that led to the Second World War. And so, so for Kissinger, it was order that mattered, not peace. He understood after Sadat went to war in 1973 that he needed a peace process to stabilize the order, to give in the Middle East, to give the Arabs a stake in that order by negotiating a return of territory Israel had occupied in 1967 in small steps. 
His approach was incremental, cautious, step by step. He was trading territory for time, not territory for peace. And it was time that would exhaust the Arabs, as I explained before, right. and that would enable Israel to strengthen itself, reduce its isolation. And with American support, eventually when the Arabs came to terms with Israel, then Israel would have the strength enough to make the concessions, the territorial concessions necessary to achieve peace. So it, had he been in that room when I told Clinton, you can do it in your first four years in office, he would have said, just a minute, slow down. This is <laughs> well, here we are 20 years later. <laughs> so, but, but, but it seems to me uh, what, one of the most, uh, a decision that was made that maybe had other long, huge long-term, he had the chance uh, to do what he did with Egypt and Syria, with Jordan and Israel on the West Bank. And, but he didn't go down that road and was that, was that the biggest missed opportunity of applying all the lessons that you're talking about, um, territory for time, uh, that would have resulted in a different landscape today and maybe more promise ultimately for a true Palestine to emerge? Yes, um, I think it's a very good point because for all of the wisdom in Kissinger's uh, caution and his, in, desire to avoid overreaching, there was also the danger that he would miss opportunities, that he would aim too low. Right. And that happened twice. The first time, as I document in the book, before the 1973 war, 10 months before, when Sadat sent his national security advisor to meet secretly with Kissinger, and outlined to him a far-reaching initiative for peace. Kissinger, when he first heard it, was quite excited by it, as was Nixon. But then he discussed it with Yitzhak Rabin. It's ironic, of course, because Rabin became the great peacemaker. But in those days, ambassador to Washington, Israel's ambassador to Washington, he told Kissinger, forget about it. There's nothing new here. We've heard it all before. It's not serious. And Kissinger said, well, OK. And he dropped it. And it's quite possible that had he not dropped it, he might have headed off the war that, that then occurred 10 months later. Now, the point that you raise was about Jordan. After he'd negotiated agreements between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria, he had the opportunity to negotiate one between Israel and Jordan as well. And that would have put Jordan back into the West Bank, uh, and which the king was keen to do, which the Israelis were ready to consider. But Kissinger refused to pursue it. He said to the Israelis repeatedly, you better deal with the king or you'll find yourself having to deal with the PLO. He was quite prescient in that regard because that happened about a year later when the Arab states, in their wisdom, uh, designated the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians, and Jordan was then cut out of any role in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. The reason Kissinger uh, refused to get involved in that was because he had a hierarchical view of the international order in which the superpowers and the regional powers like Egypt and Israel and Saudi Arabia and, and, and Syria and Iraq, the regional powers needed to be tended to and you needed to establish an order in which they all had a stake. But smaller powers like Jordan didn't count. They didn't count in the balance of power. And while he liked the king, he didn't value the king. When Sadat came along and said, forget about him, let's make another deal because Kissinger's focus was on getting Egypt out of the conflict, taking Egypt out of the Soviet camp, putting it into the American camp, and by taking Egypt out of the conflict with Israel, making it effectively impossible for an Arab-Israeli state-to-state conflict to occur. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's where he was focused. 
and as a result, he missed the opportunity to put Jordan back in the West Bank under an agreement. And that could have changed the course of history yes. because the Jordanians would have had the institutions of government capable of helping the Palestinians to reestablish their state in federation, confederation with Jordan in a way that would have avoided, I think it's of course all conjecture, that would, could have avoided the blow up between Israel and the PLO uh, after Camp David in 2000 with the outbreak of the Intifada. It's uh, fascinating and thank you so much. Um, I wanna, before turning to Victoria, just one uh, further question from me. If in 1973, the blinking red light was Egypt saying, we're going to invade, we're going to attack because we have to get our land back and get peace. So what's the blinking red light today that we're missing? Well, it's a very good question um, because there is a blinking red light and we are missing it. Uh, and that is what is happening in the West Bank. Um, the Palestinian Authority, which is in supposed control of 90% of the Palestinians and 40% of the West Bank. Uh, it is crumbling as we speak. It's bankrupt financially. It's unable to pay the salaries of 25% of its civil servants. It won't be long before it's unable to pay the salary of 50% of them. It won't be long after that before it doesn't pay the salaries of the Palestinian security forces that are maintaining order in the West Bank. And even though the head of the Shin Bet, the Israeli security services, sounded the alarm just last week in the way that I am sounding them now, um, there isn't a lot of attention being paid to. International donors have basically grown tired. The Arabs have stopped funding the Palestinian Authority. The United States Congress has made it impossible through legislation for the United States to fund the Palestinian Authority. Israel too has legislation which is uh, making it uh, difficult for Israel to give the Palestinians the revenues that it collects on its behalf. These are Palestinian, not Israeli revenues. And so as a result of that, with the lack of legitimacy of Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian leader, who is in the 12th year of his fourth year term and who promised elections and then called them off. Uh, and with Hamas waiting in the wings, ready to pounce as the Palestinian Authority collapses and Israel will not allow that to happen. So we are in danger of a situation where the Israelis will move back and reoccupy all of the West Bank um, and have to take control of all of the Palestinians there. Wow. And that will inevitably lead to friction uh, and uh, a real potential blow up, which could in its, in, in its wake, as it did back in the, in the year 2000, has swapped the whole normalization process in the Abraham Accords as well. We have the wisdom of history here and a great practitioner and a great diplomat. Uh, Victoria, over to you. Yeah, great. Uh, hi, Martin, and congratulations on what is an excellent uh, book. I found it to be incredibly detailed and insightful and something to really learn from. So if yeah. as Simon introduced me as the next generation, then uh, yeah, your contributions are a text that we need to be reading to take those lessons into the future. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, speaking of the future, we have a new administration and what looks to be a new era of diplomacy and of American diplomacy. And I suppose the Biden team and the president have emphasized throughout this first year that their foreign policy is a foreign policy for the middle class, that it will be defined by its proximity to the interests and the needs and the demands of the American public. Um, but in your book, as, and as you've discussed today, Kissinger sees the US as having that kind of consistent and dedicated hand in the Middle East, and he was made sure that the US was constantly at the negotiating table, if not creating a negotiating table. So what do you think he would make of this approach or this strategy? Can the US afford to be a little more withdrawn uh, and pivoting away from the Middle East as it seems to be doing at the moment? Well, it's interesting because... Uh, times we are in now, despite all of the differences, some of which we have been discussing, uh, are not 
all that dissimilar for the time from the time that I wrote about uh, when Kissinger was engaged in Middle East diplomacy uh, after the withdrawal from Vietnam, when he no longer had the ability to back his diplomacy with the threat or use, as he, he did in Southeast Asia, the use of force. Uh, and so uh, And, and he, uh, therefore, uh, I think has something to teach us about these times. First of all, um, he would not be opposed at all to the idea that the United States has to pay more attention to the rise of China and, and to the balance of power in your part of the world. Um, and uh, things like the AUKUS agreement uh, which is really focused on, on uh, recreating a balance uh, to the rise of China. Uh, it's the kind of thing that he believes in, in, in terms of his ideas for maintaining order. But he would be the first to say that you cannot ignore the need for a balance of power in the Middle East as well. And so how to do it, how to do both at the same time, and I think the answer uh, is in uh, the United States shifting in the Middle East from the dominant power uh, in the balance of power to a, the kind of offshore balance and the supporter of those partners and allies of the United States in the Middle East who now need to step up and actually are stepping up. I'm talking about Israel and the Sunni Arab states who need now to balance the uh, efforts at domination in the region of hegemony in the region by Iran, which is a revolutionary power in Kissinger's terms. And so the status quo powers need to band together and with the support of the United States need to, to balance it. So I think that's happening. I think that's a kind of Kissingerian approach. But Kissinger understood that a balance of power alone, a balance of power alone could not be sufficient to maintain order in such a turbulent part of the world. There had to be efforts to resolve conflicts in ways that gave the powers in the region a stake in maintaining the status quo. And in that context, he viewed the peace process between Israel and its Arab neighbors as essential. And that was the lubrication of the, uh, uh, of, of the balance of power, maintaining, uh, it was a mechanism that enabled the maintenance of a stable balance of power. And so today, there needs to be a peace process. But the problem with that is you can't, get there from here, things have gone so badly between the Israelis and the Palestinians since the Intifada of, of the 2000s. So we're talking about 21 years. It's been seven years since there's been any Israeli-Palestinian negotiation uh, and something like 20 years since the, the last, uh, 23 years since the last Israeli-Palestinian agreement. So um, it, it's, it's reached a point where it's very hard to see how you could launch a new negotiation to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Instead, we need a Kissingerian step-by-step -step incremental approach. And that's what I think is possible to do now. It's urgent to get it going. The Israeli government is willing to take steps, their economic steps, but there also needs to be a territorial dimension to them. And that is what Kissinger always understood, that the peace process had to be lubricated by Israeli territorial concessions to be effective.
Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, you've already reflected on this before, but in the book, uh, one of the things that comes through is that uh, brokering peace and looking to maintain order are two very distinct goals. And so I wonder, actually, at the impasse of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations at the moment, and we saw violent conflict in Gaza, uh, and as you said uh, just moments ago, that there's a blinking alarm uh, going on in the West Bank at the moment. Um, yeah, is this is this a plastic moment? Is this an opportunity for the US to be brokering peace, or should it be looking to establish a new order or or maintain the current one? What would Kissinger prescribe for that? Yeah, I don't think it's a plastic moment. I don't think. I mean, the, the, the plastic moment that Kissinger had was after the seventy three war, uh, when um, all sides were willing to consider uh, the alternative to war, which was engaging in a peace process. Um, that, that doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, all sides have kind of dug in to their positions and, and um, there's no great push and it's certainly not coming from the United States, but it's not coming from any other external power as well. There's no push to try to resolve this conflict. What is interesting, however, is something that and then the Middle East is always surprising. You know, you never really predict what will happen. But it's something that, that is a result of the Abraham Accords. Um, everybody talks about the, you know, which is the next state to normalize with Israel. People focus on Saudi Arabia. Think about how maybe if Saudi Arabia were to normalize with Israel, they would insist on something on the Palestinians and that would lubricate the peace process and unstick things. I think that we're looking in the wrong place. Um, that, that the impact of the Abraham Accords is on Egypt and Jordan, two Arab countries that have already made peace with Israel a long time ago. But they kept Israel at a distance. They would not embrace Israel. They would not really normalize with Israel. They maintained cold peace with Israel essentially because of the lack of movement on the Palestinian issue. Now, as a result of the Abraham Accords, they have cover with these other Arab states engaging with Israel. And they also have incentive because they see the benefits of a, of a warm engagement and they don't want to miss out like they have before. And so what we're seeing now, I'm sorry for the long excursion here, but, the, but it really brings us back to your question, which is what we see now is Egypt moving into Gaza in a way that it was never prepared to do before, and with bulldozers to make new roads and to help with the reconstruction of Gaza and big posters of, of President Sisi um, extolling his virtues to the Palestinians. What's this about? The Egyptians are brokering a long-term ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. With Egypt engaging uh, and helping the Palestinians being the kind of custodian of Palestinian commitments in Gaza. And as the situation deteriorates in the West Bank, it will be interesting to see whether Jordan also now, under the cover of the Abraham Accords, has engaged more warmly with Israel, has now in, in developed, a, uh, agreed to a a joint development which was never possible in the last 20 years of Israeli-Jordanian peace, in which Jordan is going to um, have a solar uh, electricity farm that provides solar electricity for Israel, and Israel is going to desalinate water on its coast and ship it to water poor Jordan, uh, and the UAE is going to finance this whole arrangement. It's, it's amazing that we could never do it before, but it's happening now. And it wouldn't take much to add a Palestinian dimension to that. 
and to have the Jordanians move into the West Bank, much as I argued they had the opportunity to do so, but Kissinger didn't take advantage of it, but to move in now to try to bolster the Palestinian Authority and play a more custodial role for Palestinian commitments in the West Bank as well. Yeah, well, there's lots of dynamics and I'm sure they will continue to unfold under the new administration. So it'll be interesting to see whether they apply those lessons from Kissinger. Um, we have about five minutes for audience questions. Um, so we have some in the chat, which I'll, uh, I'll get to. Um, this one's from James Dedarian and he asks, um, in a review of Kissinger's memoirs, The White House Years, Headley Bull remarked that, quote, Kissinger's academic writings have sometimes seemed excessively, even comically, Wagnerian. Do you have any, any comments on uh, any of Kissinger's uh, historical writings? <laughs> well, Kissinger's memoirs are an amazing feat thousands and thousands of pages recounting um, all of the events in his uh, years in, in government. Um, but, and they are based on the documents, um, but uh, they are in some respects an obfuscation. And, and that's why it wasn't obvious to me when I decided to go back to write about Kissinger's peacemaking endeavors which he details in his, um, bio, in, in his memoirs. It wasn't clear to me that, that uh, he was doing what I now have discovered because he doesn't talk about it in those terms. He doesn't talk about his suspicion of peace and his, his uh, belief that, that order was more important. You have to go back to his doctoral dissertation to find his skepticism about peace. Um, and, and that obfuscation was part of the way that Kissinger operated when he was National Security Advisor to Nixon and then Secretary of State, um, because he basically operated in a hostile environment. Um, Kissinger, uh, Nixon, excuse me, was an anti-Semite, and, and Kissinger was a kind of outsider in the White House, Jewish outsider in the White House, and, and so he knew that Nixon was very suspicious of his loyalty to Israel, as Nixon put it. Uh, didn't want him dealing with the Middle East. And he finally found a way to get around that, subvert the Secretary of State, Will, William Rogers, who had responsibility for uh, the Middle East. Uh, eventually got control of it just because Nick, Nixon got so exasperated about it. But then he goes over to the State Department and he's in a new hostile environment where the State Department Foreign Service regarded in those days regarded Israel as a liability and as a country that the United States should distance itself from, which was something that Kissinger didn't believe in at all because he thought that would just advantage the Soviet Union um, in the midst of the Cold War. So in, in both cases throughout his time in government, he was really hiding his, his real intent and uh, what I've tried to do in this book is to, by highlighting the documents, by highlighting his conversations with Arab and Israeli leaders, to show what he was really trying to do, as I've explained. It was far more about building a, a reliable order by ameliorating conflict rather than making peace and ending the conflicts between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, one more question uh, before we finish up. Uh, Justin Patey asks, what do you make of the end of Netanyahu's time in office and is a comeback for him out of the question? No, of course not. Comeback is not out of the question for maybe Netanyahu any more than it's out of the question for Donald Trump. Um, but um, what do I make of it? First of all, I think it's noticeable um, similarly to, to Donald Trump, that the end of the Netanyahu era has led to a kind of calming. Um, 
people would that we were able to do that in the United States today. Uh, so I think that that's one important development. Whether it's enough to uh, uh, overcome Netanyahu's populist uh, uh, politics is not clear. But one thing that, that is noticeable is that Netanyahu took his nation to elections four times in two years and was unable in those four elections to secure a majority for a right-wing uh, religious coalition that he wanted to lead. So um, even if he comes back again, like Donald Trump, it's by no means certain um, that he would win. And the longer that this government is able to chalk up achievements, overcome COVID uh, and build um, on relations with the United States and with the Arab world, um, you know, the more, the more prospects it will have of, of uh, preventing Netanyahu coming back from power. But of course, there's the whole issue of Iran. We never got a chance to address that, but um, that is gonna be a real test for the uh, Israeli government. And of course, they're able to point to the fact that it was Trump under Netanyahu's influence that uh, pulled out of the deal, uh, the JCPOA, that has put Israel into, uh, and the United States into this very difficult situation where Iran is unconstrained uh, as it moves towards the nuclear threshold. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for answering those questions and apologies to those who didn't get time for. It feels like we could talk about the Middle East forever and all of the issues confronting us. So uh, thank you for answering those ones that we did get time to get around. Get around okay, with. Thank you. And I'll pass back to Simon to finish this up. Thank you, Victoria. And, uh, and thanks, Martin. Look, um, feels like we just got going, uh, but the hour's uh, gone by. Um, that was fascinating, Martin. Um, uh, your answers to the questions, um, um, that that counterfactual that you posed um, about um, what about Jordan in a moment there, where Israel might have been willing to make territorial concessions on the, and how might history have played out. But the other thing you dropped in in answering at that phase of the conversation too was the Cold War overlay, um, uh, pulling Egypt away from the Soviets. Um, there are so many. Um, threads have come up in this. It'd be great to perhaps at another time when we might go back and, and revisit those, get a real masterclass in um, thinking about sort of, frankly, the last 50, 60 years of, uh, of global strategic affairs, you know, you know, through which, you know, uh, a focus on the Middle East indeed is a, is a, is a pretty vivid, uh, um, helpful uh, platform on which to sort of interrogate that. And so too is the focus on Kissinger. And, and that leads to my last observation. Um, I know, Martin, your interests um, are, are really driven by your passion for the Middle East. And it's, that's what's led you to this study of Kissinger in this instance. But for those of us here in Australia at this moment in our history of our strategic affairs, Kissinger on China um, is perhaps the next big topic uh, to bite off. And I don't want to sure. put that one at your feet necessarily, but um, perhaps again, if for a further conversation, given how much you've studied Kissinger vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Middle East, um, the other big question about Kissinger's legacy is, of course, uh, with respect to China. And, and perhaps, as I say, that might be something we get into of, of great interest and pressing interest uh, for, for, for many folks here in Australia. Uh, Bruce Wolpe, uh, any, any, I'm going to just throw back to you real briefly uh, if you want to yeah. make some closing remarks. Uh, just to say th thanks, Simon, for making our platform available to Martin. Victoria, thank you for <laughs> contributing to it. And uh, Martin, Martin's coming to us uh, this evening in Colorado from Aspen, which I've long called the Golan Heights of Colorado, and uh, really, <laughs> really terrific. So it's all it's all downhill from there, Martin. Okay, and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, Put my skis on. That's it. Thanks, yeah, everyone. I, I, okay. I don't thank have you very a rim much for having me. That's right. I don't have a rim shot there, but thank you. And don't forget um, to buy the book. <laughs> and do buy the book uh, at, at all your favorite um, and loved um, more intelligent bookstores around Sydney. Um, and Australia, uh, and wherever you're joining us from, don't forget to get Martin's uh, book. Um, 
The other thing, let me just say too personally, Martin, um, when I was um, became the CEO of the United States Study Center as a long time uh, Australian who's lived in the United States for a long time, I said, well, wow, um, one day I'll get to rub shoulders with the likes of Martin Indyk. And uh, it, only <laughs> took, it only took six years and it's only virtually. Um, but virtually, it, but it's, yes. been, it's been a real pleasure. And, um, and, and frankly, your career, the success you've had in the US is such an inspiration, I think, for a lot of Australians who are looking at just what is possible. Um, uh, you can go make a career. It says something about you, but it also says something about the United States. Uh, the well, way it says that- something about Australia too. Uh, got a well said, Martin. Bless you. Well said. Well said. And and that's a great note to end at one minute past the hour. Um, look, um, happy holidays uh, to, to you all, wherever you're joining us from, be it winter in your hemisphere, but a, but a well-earned summer break coming up here at the United States Study Centre. Uh, we've got, though, one more to go. Um, there's there's the book, sorry, uh, but, but coming up, I'll, I will tease this. Um, we've, got, we've got this uh, Charlie Adele, who's back in Washington now, um, the Australia chair, the inaugural Australian Studies chair at the at CSIS there on Think Tank Alley, in um, on uh, Mass Ave there in 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 Washington. But Charlie um, finishing up his term with us as a, a non-resident fellow, and our own uh, John Lee have secured the fabulous Evan Osnos, um, um, author of Wildland. The Making of America's Fury. Um, Evan, a uh, longtime staff writer with The New Yorker. That'll be, that'll be a fabulous one. I thought we were ending the year today with Martin, but apparently not. One more to go on Thursday. That's 10 a.m. Eastern Australian daylight time. Thank you all. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Victoria. Take care.